Welcome to Lesson 12e, the Irritational Flow Approximation. In this lesson, we define irritational regions of flow. We introduce the velocity potential function. We simplify it to 2D flow. Revisit the stream function and apply it to irritational flow. We'll show a simplified Bernoulli equation for 2D irritational regions of flow. And we'll do an example problem. First of all, what is irritational flow? Recall that the vorticity, which is Greek letter zeta, is defined as the curl of V, or del cross V. If zeta equals zero, the flow is irrotational. If zeta is not equal to zero, the flow is rotational. In this lesson, we're interested in this case. We're discussing irrotational flow. It's an approximation in most cases. Here's a vector identity from your math class. If del cross some vector B equals zero, then B can be expressed as the gradient of some function phi. B is a vector, but phi is a scalar called the potential function. In fluid flow, we'll let B equal the velocity vector. So if del cross V equals zero, then V equal the gradient of phi. And phi here is then the velocity potential, or some people call it the velocity potential function. But as we set up here, del cross V is zeta, the vorticity. So I'll make this statement. If the flow is irrotational, in other words, vorticity is zero, then V equal the gradient of phi. Since phi is the velocity potential, irrotational flow is also called potential flow. I'll use these words interchangeably. Let's look at the components of V equal gradient of phi. In Cartesian coordinates, U equal del phi del x, V equal del phi del y, and W equal del phi del z. In planar cylindrical coordinates, U r equal del phi del r, u theta equal 1 over r del phi del theta, and u z equal del phi del z. Note that phi is useful for 2D or 3D irritational flow. Now let's talk about where this irritational or potential flow is valid. I'll use an airfoil as an example with some free stream flow. Here are some streamlines of the flow, and provided that this flow does not separate, we have a thin boundary layer that forms along the walls, and they merge into a wake. In a previous lesson, we said that the flow outside of the boundary layer could be considered inviscid. Here we'll say that outside of the boundary layer and wake, the flow is approximately irrotational. But in the boundary layer and in the wake, the flow is rotational. We said pretty much the same thing in our previous lesson, calling this inviscid and the boundary layer and the wake viscous. So this is indeed similar, but inviscid and irrotational are not exactly the same. In the inviscid flow approximation, we neglect all the viscous terms. In the irrotational flow approximation, we keep the viscous terms in, but we approximate that the flow is irrotational. It's most proper to say that these are regions of irrotational flow, since the entire flow field is not irrotational. Now let's look at the equations for these regions of irrotational flow. We have continuity, del dot v equals zero, but v equal the gradient of phi, so del dot del phi equals zero, but you should recognize this as the Laplacian operator. So continuity equation becomes del squared phi equals zero. This is the Laplace equation for phi. In Cartesian coordinates, this is how we expand the Laplacian. And in planar cylindrical coordinates, we expand it this way. Now let's look at the Navier-Stokes equation. I write it out in vector form. In the viscous term, we let v equal del phi but the order of differentiation does not matter if phi is smooth and continuous. So we can take the del operator first, operating on del squared phi. But del squared phi equals zero by continuity. So this term goes away. In fact, the entire viscous term goes to zero, since the gradient of zero is zero. So this Navier-Stokes equation reduces to rho dv dt equal negative gradient of p plus rho g. We recognize this as the Euler equation, which is the Navier-Stokes equation without the viscous terms. This is the same Euler equation we had for inviscid flow in a previous lesson. Here, for irritational regions of flow, the viscous terms drop out of the Navier-Stokes equation, but for a different reason than for inviscid regions of flow. It's a subtle point because we end up with the same Euler equation. For inviscid regions of flow, we simply ignore the viscous terms. But for irrotational regions of flow, we don't just drop the viscous terms. They drop out because of the irrotational approximation. Now I want to look at the Bernoulli equation. 
Recall from a previous lesson, namely the inviscid flow approximation lesson, we started with the Euler equation, used a vector identity and some algebra to get this equation, the gradient of the quantity p over rho plus v squared over 2 plus gz equal v cross zeta. But zeta equals 0 in an irrotational flow region. So the gradient of this quantity in parentheses must equal 0. But we know from math class that if the gradient of scalar b is 0, then b must be a constant. In other words, b is not changing because its gradient is 0. So the grouping of terms in parentheses must equal constant everywhere. Recall from a previous lesson what I call the beloved Bernoulli equation was p over rho plus v squared over 2 plus gz equal constant along a streamline. This is valid for rotational flow, but it's for inviscid regions of flow. This equation is valid for irrotational regions of flow. While this equation is even nicer than the beloved Bernoulli equation, I'll call it the most beloved Bernoulli equation. The constant applies everywhere in the flow, not just along a streamline. As we saw in our previous lesson with solid body rotation, that was a rotational flow, but it was inviscid, and the Bernoulli constant changed as we changed streamline. If we have an irrotational region of flow, the Bernoulli constant is constant everywhere. We can say then that the irrotational flow approximation is more restrictive than the inviscid flow approximation, and thus the Bernoulli equation is simpler. Note that inviscid regions of flow are not necessarily irrotational, as we saw in our solid body rotation example. Likewise, irrotational regions of flow are not necessarily inviscid, although as I showed, when the flow region is irrotational, the viscous terms drop out. Another way to say this is that the viscous terms cancel each other out when the flow is irrotational, but the individual viscous terms themselves are not necessarily zero. Now let's limit our discussion to 2D irrotational or potential flow. We can model many interesting and practical flows if we restrict our analysis to flows that are two-dimensional, steady, incompressible, and irrotational, keeping in mind that this holds only in regions of the flow, regions that are away from solid walls and wakes and other rotational regions. So let's look at our equations. First, let's look at velocity potential, v equal the gradient of phi. In two dimensions, we have u equal del phi del x and v equal del phi del y. Continuity equation reduced to del squared phi equals 0. In 2D, this reduces to del squared phi del x squared plus del squared phi del y squared equals 0. The irrotationality condition was that zeta equals 0, or del cross v equals 0. In 2D, the z component of vorticity is del v del x minus del u del y equals 0. Finally, we can define a stream function for this 2D flow. From a previous lesson, we had u equal del psi del y and v equal negative del psi del x, where psi is the stream function. If we plug this definition of psi into our irrotationality condition, we get negative del squared psi del x squared minus del squared psi del y squared equals zero, which gives the Laplacian of psi equals zero. Thus our Laplace equation holds for both phi and psi when we have 2D irrotational flow. Here's a summary of all our equations for 2D steady incompressible irrotational flow in the xy plane or in cylindrical coordinates the r theta plane. The irrotationality condition, the velocity potential, the Laplacian, and the most beloved Bernoulli equation, which we derived from the Euler equation. By the way, to use this equation, we first calculate the velocity field, and then capital V squared is u squared plus v squared. It's the square of the magnitude of velocity. For reference, I wrote out all these equations in cylindrical and Cartesian coordinates. Now let's do an example problem. We have the two velocity components of a steady 2D incompressible velocity field. Note that we're ignoring units in this problem. We also ignore gravity, and we have one boundary condition at the origin, where p equal p naught. Let's generate expressions for the velocity potential function, the stream function, and the pressure field. First, let's verify our equations and approximations. In the interest of time, I'll go through these rather quickly. Continuity equation is valid. The irrotationality approximation is valid. So this is a valid 2D steady incompressible irrotational flow. To calculate the velocity potential, we write out the two components of this equation, and we follow the same procedure we did in previous lessons 
for partial integration. I pick one of these, del phi del x equal u equal 2x plus y. I integrate and add a function of the other variable. Now I differentiate with respect to y, but that has to equal v, and I now solve for f prime of y, which I can integrate, and I get f of y equal minus y squared plus c1. I plug this into our equation for phi, and my answer is phi equal x squared plus xy minus y squared plus c1. c1 is arbitrary because we always are using derivatives of phi, and the derivative of a constant is zero. Let's verify the Laplacian. The x derivative of phi is 2x plus y, and when we differentiate again, we get 2. Del squared phi del y squared turns out to be negative 2, so the Laplacian is satisfied. We calculate the stream function using a similar technique. I start with del psi del y equal u, and I integrate, adding a function of the other variable. But del psi del x is minus v, and from the equation on the left, del psi del x is 2y plus f prime of x. Equating these two, we know that f prime of x is negative x, which we integrate, and we add a constant which I'll call c2. So our equation for psi is negative x squared over 2 plus 2xy plus y squared over 2, plus an arbitrary constant c2. The viewer can verify that del squared psi equals 0. Finally, let's calculate the pressure. I'll use the most beloved Bernoulli equation, but in this problem we're ignoring gravity. I multiply by rho and solve for p. I get p equal rho times this constant minus rho v squared over 2. But rho times a constant is just another constant, which I'll call c3. We apply the boundary condition to get that constant namely at the origin p equal p naught, u turns out to be zero, and v turns out to be zero at the origin. So the square of the magnitude of velocity is also zero at the origin. Thus at the origin, p equal p naught equals c3 minus zero. So c3 equal p naught, and finally we have p equal p naught minus rho v squared over two. This is our final equation for the pressure field. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.